Tonight, Trans Mountain gets the green light again. Now, it's time to take the next step. Ottawa pushes ahead with a controversial pipeline extension. Show me the pipeline. Where is it? Uh, we would not move ahead with this project. From Alberta's oil patch to the BC coast, what the decision means for Canada's economy and environment. He declared Canada to be a Judeo-Christian uh, civilization, that Canada had no place for uh, uh, goat herder cultures. Under fire again, Conservative MP Michael Cooper is accused of making disparaging remarks about Muslims, a CBC News exclusive. Are we going to hit our Paris targets? No, we're going to fall short. Electric vehicles and even a carbon tax aren't nearly enough. So what would it take to meet Canada's climate commitments? This is The National. The government calls it an opportunity to grow the economy and protect the environment. Critics say it does neither. Still today, amidst immense pressure and, of course, a looming election, the federal government announced it's pushing ahead with the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Let's start with the decision itself. Today, I am announcing that our government has newly approved the Trans Mountain expansion project going forward. The decision was widely expected. After all, the $4.5 billion investment was made with your tax dollars when the federal government bought the pipeline project to move Alberta oil to the B.C. coast. But nine months ago, the pipeline expansion was delayed. The Federal Court of Appeal ruled Ottawa didn't consult adequately with Indigenous communities or properly study the environmental impact. At the end of the day, we listened and we are acting on what we heard. Today, the government committed that every dollar earned from the project will fund clean energy projects. And if and when the pipeline is sold, that money will go to green projects too. Ottawa will now meet with Indigenous communities interested in buying part or all of the pipeline. They'll also be involved in marine response plans and overall construction. But we know that there are still going to be people uh, who remain unconvinced. Uh, but I also know that the vast majority of Canadians understand that we need to grow the economy and protect the environment at the same time. But for a project that has faced such intense protest, fueled a divisive debate, been delayed and delayed, will today's decision be enough? There are still a number of immediate steps to do in terms of permitting, uh, but uh, the plan is uh, to have shovels in the ground this summer. So it's not clear exactly when construction will begin, but one thing is certain. There is a lot riding on this project, both for the Prime Minister and his government. So with an election not so far off now, David Cochran has a closer look at the politics behind the decision. Bonjour tout le monde. Here they go again, Canada's newest pipeline owners giving their non-green project yet another green light. Now I know some people are disappointed by this decision. I understand your disappointment. Disappointment immediately from the left. Uh, we would not move ahead with this project. We would immediately end any construction and moving forward with this project. It shows the fine and arguably contradictory line this government walks on climate and the economy. I'm very happy to announce that as early as 2021... Canada this move comes one week after announcing a ban on single-use plastics one day after voting to declare a climate emergency. We've also been listening carefully to Canadians and hearing about their desire for a cleaner future. So Trudeau proposes to thread that environmental needle by pouring all pipeline profits into clean tech. That's why we've decided that every dollar the federal government earns from this project will be invested in Canada's clean energy transition. But even with that, the pipeline is simply too much for the Greens. They will build a pipeline to blow through our Paris targets, use our own money to do it. And too little, too late for the Conservatives. I doubt his sincerity because he hasn't actually done anything. Show me the pipeline. Where is it? He announced last year that it would be operating this year, and it's not. I don't believe he actually wants it built. He doesn't support our energy sector. I take him Scheer makes that claim even though Trudeau has spent enormous political capital and billions in real capital to get to this point.
only to find himself under attack from the left and the right. So to those who want sustainable energy and a cleaner environment, know that I want that too. But in order to bridge the gap between where we are and where we're going, we need money to pay for it. So, David, this project has been so politically charged, obviously. Trudeau struck a, a pretty partisan tone this afternoon in his press conference, conceding the pipeline will be a big issue uh, in the election. So there is a lot at stake for him, too, obviously. Yeah, Rosie, a lot of recent polls have suggested that that broad coalition of progressive voters that elected Justin Trudeau is splintering. Mm -hmm. And a decision like this can really accelerate that splintering or at least cement it in place, especially in a key battleground area like the B.C. Lower Mainland, where this pipeline is pretty unpopular. So that's the downside. And it's hard to see the upside in the provinces most behind this pipeline because Alberta and Saskatchewan, they've never been kind to the Liberals. So the pitch is, the hope is, is that that more middle-of-the-road voter can see the economic merits of this project and the wisdom of putting the money into clean energy investments. But none of that's certain right now. So we know that when this pipeline is built, it will deliver a lot of oil, but it's not at all clear if it will deliver a lot of votes. Okay, David Cochran in Ottawa tonight. Thanks, David. You're welcome. Today's approval will have arguably the most impact far west of Ottawa. Carolyn Dunn has reaction from the industry and along the pipeline route. Along the Trans Mountain expansion route, pipe is already being stockpiled. This town's economy has been clobbered in part because there's no way to get Alberta resources to overseas markets. Hotel manager Bogusha Pomeranke says today's approval is giving her hope. Uh, the hotels and other businesses are just waiting like for the rain in the desert for this project. But people here say they've heard that before. I mean, my confidence is rattled on, on uh, going forward, right? Can, <laughs> is there going to be another in, injunction? Is there going to be another something to stop it, right? Oil and gas executives watching the announcement had a muted reaction. They say the approval is a good first step, but if the Liberals pass their Bill C-69 with its regime of regulatory reviews for major projects, the industry will be hobbled. Is leave wide open any uh, future energy project to massive amounts of judicial, political and regulatory interference that destroys confidence for building um, energy projects. That's not the only industry challenge. Some indigenous and environmental groups have already vowed to keep fighting the expansion. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney says he raised that today with Justin Trudeau. And I would simply reinforced Alberta's hope that the federal government will ensure uh, that the rule of law prevails and that uh, the tiny minority who are committed uh, to breaking the law in order to uh, block uh, our, our economic progress are not allowed to prevail. Regardless of battles to come, preparation for pipeline construction is in high gear. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. In BC today, one of the First Nations that halted uh, pipe, the pipeline in the court said it's not going to give up that fight. After consultation with our community and our council, we will be appealing this decision to the Federal Court of Appeal. We the chief said that now that the federal government is the project owner, it is a, quote, clear conflict of interest. The, the premier said B.C. will continue asking the Supreme Court to consider whether B.C. has the power to restrict the flow of additional oil from Alberta. One B.C. community on the Trans Mountain route is still hurting from a previous rupture in the existing pipeline, Coldwater First Nation. People there want to change the new pipeline's route to avoid their territory, but that means more talks, more government process. Greg Rasmussen went there to hear from some of the pipeline's opposition. For the Coldwater First Nation, it's all about protecting this water. They want the new pipeline rerouted to safeguard the community's aquifer. But today's decision didn't address those concerns. We need water. Water is life. Water is sacred. After years of fighting, Chief Lee Spahan is frustrated. The meaningful dialogue that was supposed to happen never happened. We had meetings with uh, Canada's representatives. We asked questions. And they went unanswered because the representatives, Canada's representatives, had no authority to answer them. For the community, the broader issue is trust. Can they believe the promises being made about benefits and safeguards? 
what happens if a spill occurs. And it's like on my field, I don't know what the chemical was. It Buried be beneath different. Janice Antoine's feet, a river of petroleum flows through the existing pipeline. Underneath there is where pipeline pipes are. On a recent tour of her farm near the Coldwater River, she pointed out monitoring wells put in place after the pipeline leaked. She says it was never properly cleaned up and she still can't farm the land. I guess what I'm looking for is assurance that the water is safe and that the soil is safe. Antoine's experience leaves her wondering whether anyone is listening to her community's concerns. Disheartened, brokenhearted. Um, I'm not giving up hope and I'm not quitting, but I just, just don't know what else to do. Today's decision to proceed didn't settle the issue here. It only means more talks. Meanwhile, just down the highway, preparations continue for one of Canada's largest and most controversial projects. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Coldwater, BC. Tomorrow, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer will outline his party's plan for climate change. Today, CBC News obtained a little piece of that policy. A Conservative government would make big polluters invest in green technology, funding scientific advances to counter climate change. The aim would be to keep the money in the private sector rather than use a government tax. Now to a CBC exclusive. It was just a few weeks ago that Alberta MP Michael Cooper was kicked off a House of Commons Justice Committee. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer called his treatment of a Muslim witness during a parliamentary hearing insensitive and unacceptable. Now, two of Cooper's former law school classmates say the incident prompted them to come forward. They say he made bigoted remarks more than a decade ago, but Cooper denies it. Evan Dyer has our story. Hello, Bill. Against my name is Michael Cooper from Edmonton, St. Albert. Michael and Cooper was already active in Conservative Party politics as a young man entering law school. His fellow students say he had strong opinions and liked debate, but in one 2008 seminar on the Charter and Minority Rights, the conversation turned to the place of Muslims in Canadian democracy, and that's when some students say he went further than before. The exact words that I recall was, um, in, in, he... After completing his rant about multiculturalism, he, he declared Canada to be a Judeo-Christian civilization that had no place for, and I quote, goat herder cultures. I do recall suggesting that Canada was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And I recall that some members of the class uh, didn't take kindly to that comment. With respect to that latter alleged comment, I did not say that. Uh, I know I didn't say it. It's not something that I would say. And uh, I've spoken to uh, two former classmates who you have spoken to who have no recollection of me saying the same. One of those two classmates said he was almost certain the comment hadn't happened, but declined to go on the record. The other said he preferred not to take a position. CBC News also spoke with three other people who were in the room. Two said they vividly recalled the goat herder comment. The third said he couldn't remember the exact words, but was confident that Cooper had directed what he called a racist remark at Balkis Meharig, the only Muslim in the room. Balkis Meharig also published an article in the law school's newspaper at the time, in which she described the incident, including the comment about goat herder cultures, although she didn't identify the speaker by name. She says it was a small law school and most people knew who she was talking about. I addressed what happened and I, I made it, you know, a learning moment. Were you aware of that article at the time when it came out? Uh, I had heard something about it and I, I believe that I had seen it, but uh, again, I, I, I absolutely didn't say the latter comment. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer said in May the party has no room for people who believe religion or race makes one person superior to another. And if there's anyone here who disagrees with that, there's the door. You're not welcome here. For now, the party is standing behind Cooper, who says he's considering legal action. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, let's turn now to the big political story in the U.S. tonight. Andrew Donald Trump formally launching his 2020 campaign. Yeah, and he shows the all-important swing state of Florida to kick things off. And as long as you keep this team in place... 
We have a tremendous way to go. Our future has never, ever looked brighter or sharper. Trump wasted no time attacking the media, talking up the economy, and positioning himself as a president under siege. Now, over in another key swing state, Trump supporters were watching all of this unfold. Ellen Morrow is in Pennsylvania tonight with more on how people there are feeling. At this southern Pennsylvania restaurant, the president's supporters tonight brimming with pride in his first term and anticipation for a possible second. He's got to have a second term so he can finish what he's starting. Trump will pull through in Pennsylvania. I know he'll pull through um, for the rest of the United States. So we're really just excited. Trump show. The re-election push is well underway for the Trump faithful. There's a lot of proud Trumpers out there. The president's most loyal supporters already planning phone banks, voter registration drives, whatever they they can for Trump to win. He cares about the people, um, particularly those of us that have felt kind of like we were forgotten in the in the busyness of, of you know DC. Trump support in rural Pennsylvania is still strong despite a tumultuous first term. But recent polling shows Democratic frontrunner Joe Biden ahead statewide. Where are those Republicans now? Charlie Thompson um, has covered Pennsylvania politics people, for 30 years. Uh, if the Democratic nominee nationally is, is more of the center than of the, the left, then the Democrats' chances rise in Pennsylvania. That's not so at this diner, showing Fox News sounding the alarm on immigration. The Democratic Party will not like Trump. Once an Obama voter, Jeffrey Palmer says Trump deserves four more years, no matter the opponent. Trump has a backbone where he's just not scared to step on toes. USA! Back at the watch party, the same sentiment and no concern over the turbulence and scandal of the Trump presidency so far. Right. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And other stories we're following tonight on The National. Confirmation that a Canadian soldier has died after a training accident overseas. I want to pass on our deep uh, condolences, not only to the family, but also uh, to all the members who have uh, served with Bombardier Labrie. Bombardier Patrick Labrie was from Quebec, taking part in a multinational training exercise in Bulgaria last night. He, another Canadian, and two U.S. soldiers were hurt, but Labrie died from his injuries. An investigation has been launched. <laughs> Police are searching for a fourth suspect after gunshots sent Raptors fans running during yesterday's tribute to the NBA champs in Toronto. Four people were shot, three others charged with weapons offenses. And while police did seize two guns, the bullet casings at the scene don't match up. So police are still looking for another suspect and another gun. Now that violence has cast a shadow over one of the biggest events Toronto has staged in years, and perhaps most jarring, how such a small group of people could turn such a massive event sour so quickly. So could and should authorities have done more? Here's Mike Crawley. After the party, someone has to clean up. As workers dismantle the remnants of the Toronto Raptors' victory celebration, some in this city are dissecting how it was handled. If you know, John Tory wants to show up and sit on stage um, to be recognized as part of the Raptors team. He needs to, to also take responsibility for our safety. The complaints include the parade's three-hour delay, too little water, and too few porta potties. You know that when you're when you turn around a parade in three or four days, that something is going to get missed. Toronto's mayor believes things went fine, despite a shooting. Aside from that one very jarring incident, that the day was overall an extremely successful day. That... Four shots, then utter panic. <laughs> Thousands of people flee Nathan Phillips Square and the nearby streets. Four people suffered gunshot wounds. Well, there were shots that went off over here, and now there's shots going off over there. There's really nowhere you can go. Adam Daddario hid in a parking garage. Scared because uh, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that there was gunfire. This woman was running behind me, screaming and screeching. And I'm like, I'm not looking back. I'm just running forward. But it was a terrifying feeling. When you look at how quick the law enforcement responded and were able to apprehend three people with two firearms, uh, that's, a, that's a good day for the most part. You can't prevent 
every random act of violence that can take place in a public space. Bill Blair used to be Toronto's police chief. Millions of, of Canadians out, you know, celebrating something of, 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 frankly, legitimate national pride, and that some fool would bring a gun to such an event is, is extraordinary to me. Shootings were reported at the last three NBA victory parades in both Oakland and Cleveland showing that Toronto is not alone in having its celebration tarnished by violence. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, what will it take to hit Canada's climate target? How about a lot more electric cars and maybe a carbon tax? And it's supposed to be a simple way to protect your home from flooding and erosion. When you push on the side of the building, you can actually see the building moving. We'll take a closer look as our climate change series continues. After the break. CBC News' climate change series in our backyard continues tonight. The impacts we're feeling now, the consequences to come, how it's reshaping our economy and how we are responding. Tonight, we're focusing on public will and action. In a poll commissioned by CBC News, 4,500 Canadians who agreed to participate in online polls were asked about their views on climate change. For many, it is clearly important. In fact, 19% say climate change is the issue that worries them the most. And 65% say Canada isn't doing enough to fight it. But when it comes to paying more taxes for the effort, well, there's some reluctance. 17% are willing to pay no more than 100 bucks a year. That's less than a Netflix subscription. 32% of respondents don't want to pay anything at all. A note on the data, a sampling error can't be calculated for this kind of poll. So Canada remains committed to the Paris Agreement, making major reductions to carbon emissions by 2030. The carbon tax, part of that overall effort. But Connie Walker shows us that most solutions you've heard of, from carbon taxes to electric cars to solar and wind, just won't be enough. Barry and Hermine Steinberg are in the market for an electric vehicle. It's on. The engine's so quiet. The Steinbergs say climate change convinced them to go green. Yeah, I think all governments have to get far more aggressive about addressing climate change. The federal government's plan to lower emissions is laid out in its pan-Canadian framework. It includes a carbon tax, rebates for electric vehicles, and bigger investments in renewable energy. But even with those changes, government estimates show Canada won't reach the 2030 targets. So what would it take for Canada to reach its Paris goals? And that's right. We asked Navius Research in Vancouver for help. They use climate modeling to test how different policies affect emissions. We're going to fall short. Jotham so Peters is Navius's director. So we asked you to take a look at electric vehicles. Yeah. What if by 2030, 100% of the vehicles sold in Canada were electric? Yeah. How much would that close the gap? So we saw that closing the gap in the range of around 12 million tons. So we're still short about 100 million tons. Right now, about 80% of our electricity comes from renewable or nuclear energy. What if we took that even further and increased the carbon tax? If by 2030 our electricity grid produced zero emissions and the carbon tax continued to go up by $10 per year, even combined would still fall short by 30 megatons. In order for Canada to achieve its Paris commitment, it would either have to continue or in increase its stringency for the policy that is already implemented, um, or it would have to implement new policies on sectors that we have not directly targeted um, for emissions reductions. The oil and gas industry is responsible for a quarter of Canada's total emissions. Policies like a stricter clean fuel standard would lower emissions in buildings, the transportation industry and the oil and gas sector and would be more than enough to close the gap. All of these possible scenarios would have ripple effects on industry and the economy. Meeting Canada's Paris targets depends on just how far people and governments are willing to go. Connie Walker, CBC News, Toronto. If Canada fails to meet its targets, uh, Paris targets, there are no legal repercussions, but it will be another blow to the international effort to combat climate change. And scientists warn that even if the world does meet those targets, keeping global temperatures to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, climate change will still have a dramatic impact. 
And of course, for some, it's already begun, whether it's melting permafrost, erosion, or flooding. Climate change is increasingly shifting the ground beneath our feet and beneath our homes. Katie Nicholson shows us what homeowners are doing to protect themselves, but the solution comes with its own risks. See, these are smaller jacks. For Ed Cutler, opening the cottage for the season also means climbing under it. I even put triple beams under where the posts are because they said I, I didn't have enough support over the center posts. These posts were supposed to anchor his summer home to the ground, only it didn't work out that way. You'd be sitting down or you'd be laying in bed and somebody would walk around. It felt like you were on a, um, on a boat in the water. Helical piles are steel posts with a helix on the end of them. They're driven deep into the ground to stabilize and support structures above, like decks, walkways, wharves, and as an alternative foundation for homes. They are being used increasingly to shore up structures anchored in soil affected by climate change. But the job has to be done properly. So that's basically level. That's where it goes down to. So when you close it, the bottom doesn't close, you gotta lift it up. I reframed these last fall. Inside Cutler's so cottage, far, doors hang off kilter, but it uh, could have been worse. Floodwaters lifted this Bathurst, New Brunswick house off its pilings in 2017. When the water receded, it came back down, just not where it was before. Eventually, it collapsed. A civil suit filed in a New Brunswick court alleges the company didn't install the pilings properly. As the water rises, this will come out. Okay. They will disconnect. And let's say yours stays in, okay. but mine will now fall, and the whole structural integrity of this structure will crash to the ground. Julian Roising owns a helical pile company. This is our main manufacturing floor. Okay. Helical piles must be certified by the Canadian Construction Materials Centre, once approved, they have to be manufactured and installed according to their specifications. 100 tons of pressure. Roising says his company followed those specs to the letter, but he kept losing out on jobs, and he was curious why. So we set up uh, dummy sites. We had uh, four or so uh, competitors install their piles. We sent them out to third-party laboratories. We tested them. Uh, we weren't actually expecting to come back with so many issues. The report, prepared by a Montreal-based lab, found some companies were using the wrong steel, were painting parts of the posts instead of galvanizing them, and in some cases, the welding wasn't done properly. When you do things incorrectly like that, you're basically putting your customer's public safety in, in jeopardy. That's what's happening. Roising shared his findings with the CCMC. It issued this bulletin reminding industry and building inspectors of the guidelines, including that a registered professional engineer should provide a signed and sealed certificate for every project. And just this week, it confirmed it is taking further steps to investigate Roising's complaint with site visits at other factories. Despite that, CCMC says ensuring helical piles are being properly used falls to provincial and municipal building inspectors. But that poses a problem. For the most part, they don't have an ability to look at the posts sticking out of the ground and uh, determine whether it was installed to the right depth with the right torque. Graham Clark is the president of the Canadian Association of Home and Property Inspectors. He says consumers need to protect themselves and insist an engineer reviews and approves helical pile installation. Otherwise, who's making the decision on what the loads are? Who's making the decision on uh, how deep it has to go? I mean, uh, where does the buck stop? When you push on the side of the building, you can actually see the building moving. Information Ed Cutler wishes he knew four years ago. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. So the day after we visited Ed's cottage there, the company that installed his pilings four years ago came back and they did a complete reinstall. It says it maintains high standards. If you're considering getting helical piles, the Canadian Association of Home Inspectors does have some pointers. Insist an engineer certifies the job. Check the materials used are the materials promised. Make sure they haven't been recycled from a previous site and make sure the installer is actually certified on the type of post that's being used.
CBC News' In Our Backyard coverage will continue in the coming days with Duncan McHugh, who follows those battling climate change in the courts, a push for precedent to tilt the scales toward action here in Canada and around the world. From the moment these court cases are filed, they start having an impact. We've seen it in the U.S. We've seen it in Canada, where all of a sudden, companies are now putting into their reports to shareholders, oh, you're at risk of being sued for climate change. We are asking the authorization to do a class action. The justice system is supposed to be based on laws, on fact, on science, and climate change is based on science, and politics are not. We'll have that story a little bit later this week on The National. And up next on tonight's show, a booming business in BC's backcountry. There's going to be mushrooms later on, just too dry right here in this spot. And they're worth millions of dollars. That's right after the break. Relief efforts are underway in southwest China after an earthquake left at least 12 people dead and more than 130 others injured. The magnitude 6.0 quake struck the region late last night and was followed by several powerful aftershocks. Some survivors have been found in the rubble of collapsed buildings. And according to state media, thousands have had to be relocated because of the damage. The former head of Europe's governing body for soccer spent much of today in custody and being questioned by authorities. Investigators are looking into possible corruption in the awarding of the 2022 World Cup to Qatar. And while Michel Platini has, has not been charged with any crime, he was president of Europe's top soccer association when the decision was made. 2022 would be the first time the World Cup's being hosted in the Middle East. A scary moment today for Angela Merkel as she suffered visible tremors during a welcoming ceremony for the visiting Ukrainian president in Berlin. The German chancellor later blamed the sheikhs on dehydration during the meeting and said she started feeling better after drinking some water. And the threat of wildfires has a community in northern Alberta ready to evacuate at a moment's notice again. The people of high level have already had to evacuate once. That was last month. And now they're being warned again about very dry conditions that could lead to fast moving fires. Now you wouldn't know it unless you looked very carefully, but rising from the ashes of Canada's wildfires each year is a thriving multi-million dollar industry. Now, every summer, hundreds of people flock to British Columbia in search of lucrative morel mushrooms. They sprout up on burned soil, and the end product is in demand right around the world. Anita Bath went to check it out. One slash of a knife. There's one like right in front of you. Oh. Neva Givnish is morel hunting, but the Philadelphia native's seventh season coming back is a bit different. I don't go out as much. I'm actually pregnant and I have a baby that I'm taking care of. Still, she climbs over fallen trees, pushes through branches, her face covered in soot. There's going to be mushrooms later on. Just too dry right here in this spot. Reading the terrain in search of fertile ground and fungus gold. In this case, in a forest, hours down logging roads outside Fraser Lake. So we've had years in, in a day we can't find one bucket and we've had years where we pick a bucket an hour and then everything you pick you have to pack out you know and like a, walking through here 4k you don't want to do with 50 60 pounds on the back these pickers spend months camping deep in the bush unfazed by the potential dangers each year, there are people involved in the unregulated industry who go missing or get hurt. Morales have typically been a lucrative business because for a long time, some of the only places you could find them were in fire ravaged forests like this one. Now China is harvesting morales, changing the industry entirely and leaving a lot of uncertainty ahead. This year, pickers get $5 a pound, half of what it used to be because of those farms in China. The average person collecting up to 40 pounds a day. But with laser sharp focus. And I'm hoping to reach, you know, 50, maybe 60. If, you know, if the, the weather lets you, you know, you know, the bugs. Come afternoon, buyers set up shop. 90 bucks, my friend, right on. Yes, Pickers bring in their morels to be assessed. Don't pick too small mushrooms. We kind of like to farm them. 
all nice size, at least size of a thumb. It's beautiful. Yeah, we don't want any stems either. Norman Reeser buys for a company in the Lower Mainland, selling fresh and dried mushrooms. Fry them up in bubble. Cook them a little bit longer than you think. They're a little crispy. Really meaty texture. It's just like, oh, my favorite mushroom. <laughs> Last year was BC's worst fire season on record, so there's still months of prime picking ahead. And while Western Canada braces for another season of destructive flames, somewhere else, huh? Givnish remains fascinated by the delicious bounty that sprouts up from last year's terror. Anita Bath, CBC News, near Fort St. James, BC. Up next on The National, Thomas Dagla on a little-known chapter in Canadian history. 400 Canadian soldiers stormed the police station, which stood at this spot 100 years ago. They busted windows. They tried to set the building on fire, all in an attempt to free their comrades. What triggered a deadly riot on the streets of England? First, though, a look at a story you'll see here tomorrow night. Chris Brown takes us to Moscow for a look at Russia's push to own the Arctic. Here's a preview. As the polar ice melts, northern nations are rushing to exert their control. And with its new fleet of modern icebreakers, Russia is way out in front. This is a Ural. It's able to crunch through almost three meters of ice, and its nuclear-powered engines give it almost unlimited endurance. Russia has two other ships just like this one already, and six even larger icebreakers on the way. In June of 1919, the First World War had been over for months, but Canadian troops were still stationed overseas. It takes time to wind down a war effort. But after facing death on the battlefield, their battered minds and idle hands may have been a dangerous mix. Yesterday marked 100 years since a deadly riot that's little known in Canada, but still well remembered in an English town. Thomas Dagla dug up the remarkable history around a crime that went unpunished. A century ago, Canadian troops were known to enjoy a pint at the Rifleman Pub in Epsom, England. Just what they were doing June 17, 1919 when a fight broke out and two soldiers were arrested. Very large Canadian convalescent camp. A hundred years later, that fateful night is being revisited on this tour, retracing the steps of those Canadians who were taken on foot to the nearby police station. They now have two Canadians under arrest. Much to the anger of their comrades. The First World War had been over for months, with Canadians unable to leave just yet. Still waiting to be sent back home, some were left to heal their wounds at the nearby camp. Others spent their days in town, charming Epsom's women. They say the tension between the local men and the Canadians because of all this business of them pitching their uh, wives and girlfriends. In fact, there were 78 uh, women who actually left married Canadians. Local police became unwitting targets when tensions came to a head that night in June. 400 Canadian soldiers stormed the police station, which stood at this spot 100 years ago. They busted windows. They tried to set the building on fire, all in an attempt to free their comrades. Several police officers were injured, and that plaque marks the spot where Sergeant Thomas Green was killed. Crowds lined the streets for Green's funeral procession. Headlines back home told Canadians of the violence, with four of their countrymen sent to jail only briefly for rioting, including Cape Breton-born Private Alan McMaster, who wielded the iron bar that killed the officer. In hindsight now, experts blame post-traumatic stress disorder for that fit of rage. When he was faced that night, Alan McMaster was faced that night with the fight in the darkness, what, 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 where was he? Was, was he in a street in Epsom or was he back in the trenches? Years later, McMaster confessed to killing Green, but no one was ever convicted. McMaster said he'd been pardoned by Edward, Prince of Wales, who just happened to have a visit to Canada planned for two months later. They couldn't even contemplate the thought of him touring those places if some Canadian soldiers were 
possibly going to be hung or sentenced to life in prison. Green's family held no ill will toward Canada. In fact, his two daughters married Canadians. And this week, his descendants traveled to Epsom to remember the slain policeman. He would be in awe for just to see that, that his family continued and remembered his service, that he, it's not forgotten. A story seldom told in Canada, still resonating here. They're even serving special Sergeant Green bitter beer at the Rifleman Pub, where the story began 100 years ago. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Epsom, England. And the moment is straight ahead on The National. I was overcome with emotion, and I was really surprised at just how, um, at just how moved I was by this little gesture. A young man from a small town sees a symbol of pride and support in our moment. But first, in case you missed it. Well, there's always an end to everything, so eventually have to pack up. After spending six months in space, Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques is getting ready to head back home. Hey, Sarah, I have you loud and clear. But first, he beamed down for a chat with CBC Kids News. Are you nervous about coming back to Earth for your re-entry? It took me a while to get used to this place here. Learned to fly initially. It was actually not so easy. Now I'm pretty agile, moving around. I can be upside down. It doesn't bother me. I can fly. I can bounce off the walls and, you know, I never lose my way, but uh, it wasn't like that in the beginning. So this feels like home now. And I know that coming back to Earth, I will have to learn again to live with gravity, uh, learn again to walk and learn uh, to live again with many, many people all around me. This will be different, but I have no fear that I can, uh, I can adapt. That's the beautiful thing of uh, human nature, that we can adapt. What is your message to us and to young Canadians or young kids all around the world? The journey is as important, if not more important, than the destination. And I would tell young people, you know, it's important to find the dream that's in your soul. And if you don't have a dream, then someone else will tell you what to do. And that's just, uh, you know, that's just too bad. It's better if you decide yourself which way you go in the morning when you wake up. So find your dream and cherish it. It is your most important treasure. Saint-Jacques is scheduled to return to Earth on Monday. A celebration of excellence. Oh, yeah. It's an evening of music, pride, and inspiration. The 2019 Inspire Awards for Indigenous Achievement. Sunday at 8 on CBC. John Patrician grew up in Wolseley, Saskatchewan. Population 800. A gay kid in a small town. He says he was pretty much terrified to come out grew up and he moved away, so imagine his surprise to see his hometown paint a colorful symbol of pride. And his reaction to that gesture is our moment. I thought, oh, that's really cute, you know, kids painting a rainbow crosswalk in Saskatchewan, that was great. And he said to me, no, 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 look closer, that's Wolseley, that's the small town I grew up in. And so uh, I looked closer and sure enough, I was really stunned. I was, I was, I was overcome with emotion and I was really surprised at just how um, at just how moved I was by this little gesture, you know? I, I grew up as a closeted gay kid in rural Saskatchewan, again, town of 800 people. My parents lived two blocks from that crosswalk. For me, it's, it's, a, it's a small little gesture that I think makes it safer for queer kids out in Wolseley and out in rural Saskatchewan. And I know just having that crosswalk there is a, it's, it's a gesture for all of us who have moved away from the town. It's a gesture for all the kids there who know that it's okay to be gay. I felt so proud and I feel so optimistic for any of the other queer kids that might live there now. <laughs> so uh, John came out to his parents first at, at, at 20, he's 29 now, uh, and obviously this, this wasn't done for him, it was done in this community to send a signal to the rest of the community and, and you can see how touched he is by something like that, I mean it's amazing. Yeah, and when I saw this story, you know, my first thought was, you know, maybe it's a cliche that, that you know, small gestures can have a big impact, but, but A, it's true, but it, and there's also just the fact that it's not the only one of its kind, right? There are all sorts of small gestures that happen all over the country, and I guess in an additive sense, it, it does amount to a big thing. It's, it's hugely impactful. Makes you feel included, for sure. Yeah. That's The National for this June 18th. Have a good night.